A very strange franchise for me as a kid was the Power Rangers. Go, go Power Rangers! Being one of those late 2000s, early 2010s kids, I wasn't really around for the prime of the Power Rangers, kind of similar to my experience with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But unlike Ninja Turtles, I would never call myself a Power Rangers fan. With Ninja Turtles, even though I wasn't around when it was at peak popularity, there was still new content and media coming out that connected with me as a kid of that era. For me, it was the 2012 show with Ninja Turtles, and it should have been the 2011 Power Rangers Samurai that got me into the franchise, but ultimately didn't. It's not like I didn't watch the show, I actively tried to get into it. A lot of my friends at school were into the Power Rangers, so clearly connected with some people. But I don't know, I feel like it's more of a preference thing. I'm not going to call the show bad by any means, but I will say that I do feel that Power Rangers is very much so a product of its time. Getting its start in 1993, Power Rangers absolutely took over the world. It had an incredible run of three seasons with Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, its own theatrical film which did alright, and an incredibly successful toy line, and it's not hard to see why. Power Rangers was credited with dethroning the Ninja Turtles to become the biggest property of the mid-90s for young boys. And don't get me wrong, Power Rangers is still very much a relevant franchise, but it's had a very tumultuous time transitioning into the 2000s and therefore the 2010s as well. It's not like it doesn't evolve, because every season it evolves. It got bought by Disney in the early 2000s and ran until the late 2000s before it was bought back by Saban Entertainment, being run by them and transitioning the running of the show over to Nickelodeon. Now the franchise has been purchased again by Hasbro and has all of its shows releasing on Netflix. Needless to say, from an outsider's perspective, this has all been kind of a roller coaster and a little bit confusing, especially because there are all these different cast members every single time. A lot of the show's footage, particularly the fight scenes, derive from a Japanese aired show called Super Sentai. Power Rangers is a lot. Everybody knows who the Power Rangers are, it is popular, but I wouldn't say Power Rangers is necessarily mainstream. I don't see a lot of people walking around with Power Rangers toys and costumes and talking about the show and actively watching it. I contribute a lot of this to rights issues, but still, point still stands, Power Rangers hasn't really caught on with a new audience or a larger audience in a long time. But it's not like they haven't tried. Because in 2017, there was an attempt to bring Power Rangers back to the mainstream, start a cinematic universe, if you will. That's right, today we're talking about the Power Rangers movie from 2017. I don't think I've ever seen a movie, let alone an attempt to start up a cinematic universe, come and go so quickly. Especially because I didn't really find the Power Rangers movie from 2017 all that bad. No, this movie isn't great by any means, but it's not bad either. It seemed like a movie that would have been right up general audiences alleys, but it wasn't, and it's shocking how bad it failed, because it failed. It's kind of funny, but also sad that the Power Rangers have been dealt this unfair hand in the universe. It seems like whenever they try to attempt something new and different, everything just goes completely wrong, and this is no exception. Today, I want to take a look at the Power Rangers movie from 2017. Take a look at the film's development, the actual film itself, and the aftermath of the whole situation. This is... I kind of look at Power Rangers 2017 similar to other reboots of other franchises around that same time. Stuff like Ninja Turtles, Transformers, G.I. Joe, stuff like that. And kind of similar to those movies, Power Rangers didn't have the easiest time getting off the ground. The film was announced all the way back in early 2014. Roberto Orki, if that's how you say his name, was originally attached as the producer. He's made a lot of big blockbuster movies, just not a lot of good ones. If you want to know his most recent work, it's The Mummy. So, I think that should tell you everything you need to know. <laughs> Fun fact, this guy actually did The Amazing Spider-Man 2, but he didn't do The Amazing Spider-Man, so if you were wondering about the big drop-off, I think that should explain it. Ashley Miller and Zack Stentz were hired to write the film's script, throw the writing to behind films such as X-Men First Class, Thor, Age of Cody Banks. They eventually brought in Max Landis to do a new script, but his was rejected as well, and that's honestly good, not because of the script, but for other reasons too. Look at Lionsgate unintentionally making good decisions. But a year later, they eventually finally found the director, Dean Israelite. He directed a film called Project Almanac and it's completely fine if you don't remember this movie because I barely do either. I actually watched this movie, I got it at Redbox, yeah one of those. It was like 7 years ago, I was like 12, don't make fun of me. I watched it for like 30 minutes and then I turned it off. So after hearing he was gonna do Power Rangers, I was um... I wasn't too excited, but I could definitely see why they chose him. It's a sci-fi movie following a group of kids who go on a wacky adventure who have problems of their own and things that they want to achieve, and they're teenagers too. All kind of fits the version of Power Rangers that Lionsgate was looking for. So it had a much cleaner development than something like Ninja Turtles, but still not incredibly smooth either. At the end of the day, Israelite wasn't a proven director who'd be able to carry a franchise like Power Rangers under his belt. His belt only carried one movie, that being Project Almanac, and being an assistant to John 
Jonathan leaves been on Battle Los Angeles. Which fun fact, he actually ended up directing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I keep coming back to that movie, goddammit. Although skeptical, I was interested to see what he could bring to the table. With a cast announcement of relative unknowns, Power Rangers had a steady development from there and eventually released on March 24th, 2017. Like I mentioned earlier on in the video, this thing failed, making a worldwide gross of $142.6 million with a production budget of $100 million, which isn't that high, especially for the movie that Power Rangers is. But that $142.6 was not enough to make a profit, make up for marketing budgets, etc. So at the end of the day, Power Rangers lost the studio $74 million. Yeah, this thing bombed. But was it because of the film itself? Let's find out by taking a look at Power Rangers 2017. The film opens on planet Earth during the Cenozoic era. We get our first look at the Red Ranger who's crawling through a bunch of debris. While obviously not completely, a lot of this scene is actually practical which is much appreciated. It's also one take essentially. He crawls over to the Yellow Ranger who's dying, and then it's revealed that this version of the Red Ranger is Brian Cranston?! My name is Walter Hartwell White. I live at 308 Negro. He tells the power coins to find those who are worthy, burying them underground before he's killed. As this is happening, we get introduced to the Green Ranger, whose name we learn is Rita. And if you know anything about Power Rangers, this is a deviation from the source material. The Green Ranger and Rita Repulsa are completely different characters from each other, but in here, they decided to combine the two, and honestly, I don't have that much of a problem with it. It kind of underconvolutes what's already a very convoluted plot by setting up the Green Ranger in what I'm sure would have played a role in an intended sequel, and also this movie's villain. My problem though just comes with the character itself, but we can dive into that later, we're barely a couple minutes into this thing. She eventually gets rocked by a meteor and everyone dies. Cut to modern day where we're introduced to Jason, the Red Ranger who is essentially the main character of the movie. Him and his friend are stealing an opposing football team's cow. I just milked their- Him. You just milked- oh, A bestiality joke in the first five minutes. Okay, I think I see why people don't like this movie. Jason's alerted that the cops are coming in, they gotta run. <laughs> Okay, Power Rangers movie that's very cheap. You got me. When this movie released, I was the biggest 21 Pilots stan in the world. This definitely added some points in my book. I think I like this movie for all the wrong reasons. I don't know. But in all seriousness, the sequence is shot very well. Jason eventually crosses his truck and... <laughs> What the fuck? Now there's been nothing wrong about this movie so far outside of jerking off the cow. It's shot pretty well, it seems like it has its tone down, but gosh the pacing is so weird. From starting off in the Cenozoic era with Walter White and Rita Repulsa, to the 21 Pilots police chase scene, it's just a lot of whiplash, it feels like two completely different movies. Cut to three weeks later where Jason's dad is dropping him off at detention and he's rightfully mad at him. And I know you think it's noble that you didn't rat out your friends. I acted alone, Beefcake and I had a connection. Beefcake? What kind of connection y'all got? I don't be calling my friend's beefcake. We're then introduced to Kimberly, the pink ranger. Sorry bro, you just don't got the unspoken riz like that. We then see Billy, the blue ranger, who's getting bullied. Why don't you stop me, huh? You gonna stop me? Okay, before we go any further, can media stop portraying bullies like this? Do like these people actually exist? Let me know in the comments, because I have never seen a human being like this before. Kimberly then goes into the restrooms to meet up with her friends, and why are they in there? This must suck. It does. Well, then you shouldn't have sent Ty that picture of me. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. She sent revenge porn? That is so messed up. I'm supposed to like this character? Cutting you out. Literally. Okay, I understand why you do that, but this is a little extra. You punched his tooth out. They put it back. Don't tell me she's gonna do it. She's not gonna cut her hair. She cut her hair. How many cliches is this movie gonna throw at me in 10 minutes? Billy thinks Jason and asks if they can hang out, but Jason can't because he's under house arrest. But Billy's able to help Jason out. Jason decides to go over to Billy's after hearing his dad speak poorly on his name. And this is where we get a solid look at Angel Grove, and I'm not gonna lie, this place is ugly as hell. Something I liked about the original Power Rangers was how it was set in sunny California. It looked like a really cool place to live and have a good time with your friends. This movie, however, was shot in Canada, so it looks just really gray and sad. Oh my god, Jason Scott. Billy eventually gets Jason's tracker off, and Jason goes off to help Billy. Honestly, I'd be so sussed out right now if I was Jason. I've known this kid for under 12 hours, and he's asking me to take him to a mining facility, and he just took my tracker off. Yeah, I'm running. We eventually learn that Billy's autistic, and as a Sonic fan, it's really cool to see some representation. We then eventually get introduced to the Black and Yellow Power Ranger, or Zack and Trini, who are hanging around the mining facility as well. Guys. 
she's edgy. Jason's horny sensors go off because Kimberly is swimming in the lake, and I say horny sensors because there's literally no other indication that she is back there. There's no splash sound, there's no noise, this man just knows. Then you know I punched his tooth out. I know they put it back. They really like that line, huh? Jason and Kim really talk about how sad and depressing their lives are, which helps relate to the audience watching this movie. I could leave here, you know? Where? <sighs> Got it, anywhere. So let's go. Okay, Jason, buddy, you need to stop trusting these people you literally just met. This girl sends out revenge porn, punches people's teeth out, and she cuts her hair on a whim. She's clearly not in a good mental state. Billy then blows up this rock, which catches the attention of everyone. Okay, she's dead. They find their power coins that were buried by Zordon earlier on in the movie. But an alarm goes off like 10 minutes after all of this stuff happens, so they have to run. Okay. Okay. When I tell y'all I laughed out loud in the theater, I am not joking. While all this is going on, Jason's dad conveniently discovers the body of Rita Repulsa. Everyone wakes up in their bed somehow, don't ask me, this is never explained. Where the writers watch The Amazing Spider-Man and were like, hey, Let's do that. What are you doing? I'm just gonna quietly snap your wrist, you little bitch. This character is insane. Billy then accidentally knocks him out, and this is one of my favorite line deliveries from an extra. Billy Cranston just knocked koalas out cold! Like, what tone is this movie? The Rangers talk about what happened last night before their power coins start to do this. That's that Michelle Obama lunch. The Rangers eventually all meet at the place where they got their power coins. And I'm sorry if this is a little nitpicky, but shouldn't the cops be here right now? They eventually discover an underwater cave. Hey guys, there's something down there. They really just be doing stuff in this movie. They then find a spaceship. This movie is so convenient. And inside of that spaceship is Alpha 5, played by Bill Hader. He's definitely supposed to be the comic relief, but I'm sorry, I don't really find anything Alpha 5 does in this movie funny. The Rangers are then introduced to... Walter White! He's back! Now, this has to be one of my least favorite scenes in the movie because literally this is a 10 minute something long exposition dump. It goes against everything that a good screenplay should do. It's just telling you and not showing you anything. In fact, in my opinion, while this movie hasn't been amazing so far, it's at least been a little cohesive. There's good performances and clearly a vision behind it. But now you have to introduce the Power Rangers elements in your Power Rangers movie and you've kind of waited a long time to do so. They establish the Zeo Crystal in every planet that has life has a piece of the Zeo Crystal inside of it and Rita Repulsa is after that. This scene and a lot of the scenes from this point are an absolute bore and just dump exposition to you that you genuinely do not care about. They've done a pretty good job at setting up a character like Jason and Billy and Kimberly, but I barely know these two and if we're being real all the characters are kind of unlikable to this point, outside of Billy I'd say. I don't know, I don't like this scene. Silence. This dude's high as hell. We then get this weird, dreamy, trippy sequence with Rita Repulsa, and this doesn't scare me, it just kind of turns me on. We then return from that sequence for even more video game-like objectives and plot dumping. After a brief talk with Zordon, Jason wants all of the other rangers to be there tomorrow. We then learn a little bit more about Zack and Trini, and while it is appreciated as I do want to care about all of these main characters, it is coming in so late that it just contributes to the film having a very messy pace. The rangers all meet up the next day, and decide they do want to be Power Rangers, but they're unable to morph into their armor. Cue the training montage, including Krispy Kreme, don't worry, we'll get to that later. But even after all this training that seems to have gone on for a few weeks now, they're still unable to morph. But while all this has been going on, Billy has been trying to locate where the Zeo Crystal is. Now, take a wild guess. That is two Krispy Kreme brand integrations in under five minutes. They're then introduced to their Zords, which are these giant dinosaur robots that they can drive. Zack is insistent on being the most annoying character of the movie and takes his Zord out on a ride. This causes for him and Jason to get in a fight, but Billy breaks it up, but because Billy breaks it up, he's able to morph. But Zordon is getting frustrated by the other ranger's failure to morph, and Billy isn't able to morph after that. Rita enters the jewelry store looking for gold. She's trying to build Goldar, and we'll get to that later. 
What was that editing decision? 12 comes, she kills him, and then blows up the jewelry shop. We then have a scene of the Rangers bonding, and it's honestly one of the best scenes of the movie. I feel like when it focuses mainly on the characters, it does a pretty good job, and this helps towards their likability, which is really great. Because like I mentioned, up to this point, they've been kind of unlikable characters. Rita is interrogating Trini about where the Zeo Crystal is, and for some reason, knowing that she is a part of the Power Rangers lets her go, leading all the Rangers to meet up and go meet her by the docks. She asks where the Zeo Crystal is, and Billy finally gives her her answer. It's a Krispy Kreme. Krispy Kreme. Krispy Kreme. This is a special place. Very special. There's product placement, and then there's whatever this is. And by the way, this isn't the end of it. She then kills Billy. Nah, I'm just kidding, because only a couple minutes later, he's brought back to life. They go a solid, like, five minutes trying to give into that he's dead. And I'm sorry, but even watching this movie for the first time, it was so unconvincing. There's no way you were gonna kill off your most likable character, who's debatably the heart of your movie. And now that Billy's back, it's morphin' time. He said it! He said the thing! The Power Rangers movie finally becomes a Power Rangers movie, and it's debatably where the movie becomes worse. While this is by far more accurate to the source material, and you're finally seeing them in their colorful costumes, this is such a dramatic tone shift from where we were at only a few minutes ago, it contributes to the film's poor pacing and tone, which are two things you have to get down, and then this movie just simply doesn't. I have no problem with the Rangers suiting up in the third act, it makes it feel earned in a way. But at the same time, this is meant to start a franchise, and I know you were trying to tell a cool human story, and I appreciate that, but holding what the audience and the kids really wanted to see for so long might have contributed to this movie not being so successful. Stuff like this... <laughs> It's Super Power Rangers, it's very Power Rangers, but it's not the Power Rangers movie you've been making for the past two hours. It's been a teen drama, not this. We get even more Krispy Kreme product placement before the Rangers defeat Rita and her gold monster. Power Rangers have saved the day, and everyone lives happily ever after. The end. So, the movie wasn't great, and it also wasn't terrible either. It's clear that they had a vision and direction they wanted to take this movie, really focusing on the characters and getting them down right first before they get into all of the Power Rangers stuff. Now, on one hand, it is important to get that aspect down, but on the other hand, you are trying to start up a cinematic universe for the Power Rangers, and the Power Rangers don't come in until the final 30 minutes of the movie. The film also didn't receive a great critical reception, and I remember the marketing campaign being pretty lackluster for this thing. From the very inception of this Power Rangers, Rangers reboot at Lionsgate, there was the intention of having this be a cinematic universe starter. And when you go into a movie wanting it to be that, that's where you went wrong. Don't go into it trying to set up his cinematic universe with a bunch of lore and exposition and plot set up for the second movie, just go into it wanting to make a good movie. It sucks because there is a lot of good in this movie, there's a lot they could have built upon. I do truly think if they did listen to criticism, and now that they have the Power Rangers being the Power Rangers, a sequel could have been like 10 times better. They would have had the Green Ranger in there, which I think would have made for a fun little plot. I don't know, I do think there was potential here because there was potential in this movie and there was simply good stuff in this movie but there was a lot of bad as well. If there's one thing I could say, the cast is pretty great. Dicker Montgomery is an amazing actor who has been in a lot of really great stuff, but he needs to be in more. Naomi Scott went on to play Princess Jasmine in the live action Aladdin, which wasn't a great movie, but hey, that's a big role. She definitely got a fat paycheck. Ludi Lin has been in a lot of blockbuster movies since, like Aquaman, and he was starring in the new Mortal Kombat movies. RJ Seiler hasn't done anything that huge since, but he's doing a lot of TV and is getting plenty of work, and I honestly would like to see him in bigger stuff because he definitely was one of the highlights of the film. And Becky G, even before this movie was primarily a singer, so that's mainly what she does, but she's been in a bunch of awful movies since, so good for her. Why Becky? Why him? Why him? Point is, the cast was pretty great, and I think that they nailed that aspect down completely. I think they had an idea of what they wanted to do, and that's entirely respectable. It just sucks that they never got the franchise off the ground. But it's not like the Power Rangers franchise is completely in the dumps, it just didn't reach the mainstream like they wanted it to. The show's still running, toys are still selling, and there's a bunch of content on the way. There's reportedly a new Power Rangers reboot coming next year in 2023, produced by Paramount Pictures, who has plenty of experience rebooting kids' toy properties from back in the 90s, and there are reportedly a bunch of live-action Netflix movies happening as well. The Power Rangers aren't over, they're gonna get plenty more opportunities to transition into live-action films. It just sucks, you know? There was a lot of potential in this franchise, and I think there was a lot of good in that first movie. And while that era of the Power Rangers is over, I think it can be looked at at how to fail a franchise. Power Rangers and other aspiring cinematic universes can look at this at how to not start up a cinematic universe. I want to see the Power Rangers succeed, I think there's a lot of potential there, and this movie shows that. It'll just take somebody special to come along and show you 
how to do it. Which is why Paramount, I am coming to you today with an offer. You give me Power Rangers reboot, I give you my directorial and writing abilities. I will make the most epicest Power Rangers movie ever. I got an entire screenplay right here, it's inside my pocket right now. All I need is a 100 million dollar budget and we should be good. Anyways guys, that was my video about Power Rangers. Okay, bye, the video's over. Wonder what you want right now, wonder what you want right now. You should be proud about it, you should be proud about it. Count me all my blessings and count my dollars. Make it all back up tomorrow, i tell you how, bro. If you see me at the bottom, take a half an hour. And I kept my nappy hair inside my daddy's shower.